and we are back with some more Factorio and today we've got a problem iron iron is always a problem and it's not to do with our smelting it's to do with our actual supply we're starting to run out we need to find ourselves more iron and hook it up to the grid however there's a problem and uh, that problem is going to be solved by trains I'll warn you in advance but the problem is the iron is really far away you're not going to run transport belts that far I mean even running the transport belts from down here at the coal was a little bit of a long run it's just I was very lazy at the time. So now we're going to have to put or install ourselves a train grid. In the background I did a bit of upgrading to the mall, so we now stock train stations, rails, liquid cargoes, wagons, solid cargo wagons, locomotives and oh, whatever those are. We should now immediately be able to get into trains, however there is a bit of a downside. It's sort of the location I chose to put this area down. We're going to need a lot of space for these trains, so it's going to go back quite a distance. In fact it's going to go back Yep, we're going to keep going, and a bit further, and a bit further, and yeah, it's probably going to end up in the water a bit. So we're going to need some landfill to provide ourselves with some more space for our trains. Yes, good stuff to look forward to. Now let me figure this out. Time to make a little bit of landfill. Went over to just east of our base, uh, sorry, west of our base, and there is a big patch of stone right here. Uh, about 13 million stone. We're going to turn a bunch of that into landfill and start to, well, maybe landfilling in a bit of that lake. I want to put my rails straight through there inconvenient on my part but you know what why not we want to make things nice and neat uh, let's uh, load up and start landfilling when it comes to trains you want to give yourself a lot of space for example this is our smelting column over here and this is where our rear rail line is going to go where that will feed all of all the trains that come in to feed those it's hard to explain without actually building it so instead we're just going to start building it that requires an awful lot of landfill uh, for those of you who are not familiar you can increase the size of your landfill by pressing the plus arrow like that so let's see, yeah, we're going to want to just put down a whole bunch of landfill. Turns out this project is going to take a lot more landfill than I remembered. So I think what we'll do is we'll start installing the iron first. So this is going to be where our iron station is. It's going to be parked in here behind our smelting setup. So we're going to extend these rails on. And this here is a T-junction. You can just download them. Uh, if when it comes to trains, let's just say the simplest uh, tutorial out there is about an hour long. <laughs> It takes an awful lot of effort. I take a much more straightforward approach. This is a T-junction. You can hook up rails on either side and trains can pass through it. That's all you really need to know. Now excuse me while I clear some space. This is a right-hand drive train network and we're going to keep extending it as we need in all sorts of directions. Now, that's just putting down some power wires there. It has some built-in power wires and, oh, it doesn't have built-in lights. Damn it, I'm going to have to start including lights with this, aren't I? That is pretty much the basics of train use. You only need two blueprints. It's, well, you, for my method, you're only going to need two blueprints. One is a T-junction and the other one is the straight rails. That's it. There's the two you're going to need. Barring where you pick up and drop off resources. That will require you to do some extra designs, but for the entire in-between bits, this is all you need. And it can get you up to a quite a reasonable size base. Now, excuse me while I extend this on a bit. I should point out, though, when it comes to laying down these rails, I overlap the, the next power pole with the last one, and this allows you to just keep extending it this way. It just keeps things nice and neat. So we have got our rails to where we want them. We want to put our train stop right here. Now, one thing you can do is you can check out these signals here, and you'll see that this is a, a right-hand side train trip. You can see with those yellow arrows there, those yellow arrows on the track indicate that that's the direction the train's going to be coming from. If you go to the opposite side, you'll see... Yep, arrows indicate it's going to be coming from the opposite direction. So our train is going to sort of pull in here and stop, and then we want to be able to get it out of there to go back and get more iron. How do we manage that? Well, I'll, I'll try to go through the evolutions of how these things started. This is a 141 train, and uh, they call them 141s because they have one wagon point or one locomotive pointing in each direction. This allows them to be reversible so they can go, well, they go both ways. Now, the great thing about that is you can do something like this and you can reverse the rails out of here so oh come on do that for me right about there and boom this is also one of the reasons why this exact method here you know to get those rails across is the exact reason why the rails are this wide if you have the rails any narrower than that you can't do that little maneuver you can't get the rails to join up back that way which is why nearly every single rail design out there has their rails exactly this far apart. Uh, that being one, two rails can fit in between the, the rails themselves. That allows you to chicane this sideways. Now what we can technically do is we can drive right in here, grab what we want, and then when we'll come in this rail, and then when we go back out, we'll be reversing out this rail, allowing us to get back onto the network. This is just a very simple way of doing things. However, of course, it's not really going to de do for our needs. We want to, well, put in a bunch of chests that are going to unload resources from this. So well, let's actually install those first. 
Oh, before I go any further, I should really point out, because this is a bidirectional track, you need to put a, a rail signal on each side of them. I really don't want to get too deep into rail signals. Seriously, there's a lot of tutorials out there on them, and they go into an awful lot of depth. But just realistically, if you ever narrow a rail down to one, you want to make sure the entrance exit has uh, rail signals on each side. You can see when you bring them up, it'll, it breaks things into blocks. So we got your purple, your yellow, your blue. It just means this train is occupying this slot. This slot is free and other trains can occupy it and this one is able to reverse out when the time comes. We're, we're going to have to make a lot of changes to this as we go. We're going to do them slowly so it sort of accumulates. Now uh, let me clear out some of these trees. And this is the start of an unloading station. Uh, it's very simple. You put six stack inserters on each side and then you have them feed into steel chests. Those steel chests are then going to have stack inserters on the opposite side and they're going to have to start feeding onto transport belts. Now this is where things become a little bit more complicated when it comes to unloading. Now I'm also assuming that you're using uh, four tra uh, trains with four cargo wagons. This is sort of the standard default everyone's pretty much adapted. Well, I won't say the standard default, it's just it's probably the most common common variant that you would see out there. But more than likely they would be unidirectional. Now normally I would do unidirectional trains, but we'll start with bidirectional trains and we'll convert them all over to uni later, just, just so you can see what it's like. There's not really a big difference honestly between the two, but it's much easier to set up bidirectional trains if you're new. Okay, but uh, transport belts for unloading this. Yeah, this just looks a little bit big now that I look at it. Uh, this is the design I've been using for a while because it's pretty simple to do and doesn't require a lot of effort, but it's not going to make much sense when it's not active, so I think we'll just pop over to a quick test, tap, test map. And here's that silly design in operation. What it does is uh, we have six inserters here that are all pulling out of these chests. These chests are the buffer chests from the train, and they have to put it onto blue belt, and there's, well, this is going to cause throughput limitations. The reason being the inserters can move far more than the transport belt can handle. But if you do it just right, you can get nice streamlined output with all of the belt being fully saturated. Theoretically here, you could get out, what, 12 belts out of this? I believe there's ways of doing it even more, but we're not going to be using that for what we're trying. And by the time you get into the later game, you switch to bots and this becomes a, a non-issue. I'm, sure, I'm not sure that way inclined, I suppose, and you want to go mass belts. And this allows it all to stream out. Now let's uh, do a little playing around here. I have made a few minor adjustments for it to be more viable for our needs in this current playthrough. We're aiming for only, what, six belts of iron in this? We're... we're going to have multiple drop-offs, but this one is just going to require six drop-offs for iron plate. That's fairly straightforward. Now there is though problems. What happens if we're not drawing evenly from the system? Let's say for example this here is not in use because whatever it, it's hooked up to steel and, and steel isn't needed anymore. Or something silly along those lines. And let's put in say a red transport belt here because we've made a mistake somewhere and now we've accidentally slowed down the output. Oopsie. And then what we do is we get rid of all the input for a moment. Let's have a watch and see what happens to all of these outputs and see where it fails or where where the resources run out first. I have just set these buffer chests to only three tiles or three mm, slots. Let's uh, skip forward a bit. So the bottom row has started to run out of iron plate in some of the chests. The reason being this side is being drained faster because all of these are running at full speed and this one is not. Now, it's not the end of the world. The train that pulls in here, well, it'll all the resources will get ripped off one side, but it is a little bit uneven and it will cause, it could potentially cause us some problems. So normally what you do is you stick a belt balancer on the end. So we'll do that now and rerun the test. Same thing again, we have left one of these blocked off and another one with a red belt just to mess up the outputs a bit, just to demonstrate some unevenness. And uh, then once this gets back up to speed, we'll delete the middle ones. Now let's see how the what happens when this starts to run out of iron plate. Will it hopefully be more even so we get a more stable draw on each side? They have actually went down to a about this at the same time so far, but we haven't got to the end yet. The reason these chests are a little bit fuller is they're on the inside here. Uh, these uh, inserters will be chucking plates onto the line and they usually don't get a chance to put their plates on. That's why it takes a, it's a lot longer for them to unload. But let's see if they all run out about the same time. And there we go. They all run out pretty much exactly at the same time, which is exactly what you want. That means you're drawing evenly from both sides, and it doesn't matter if you have too much draw in one area or another. This is sort of the power of belt balancers or load balancers, whatever they're called nowadays. They just make things easier. And this is why your trains, you'll see belt tra based trains that have their own loading going off through belts. You'll have a bunch of load balancers. This one here load balances between all six outputs and condenses it down to three on both sides and then we load balance them all again so that the three from this side and the three from this side all go through. Now the reason we don't just hook them all up together is because I, I don't know how to make a 12 to 6 belt balancer. If you do, go ahead, but uh, <laughs> I just decided it's easier if I start on the smaller ones. Before we start in on actually doing how we load up the, or on the other end, I'd just sort of like to cover how we convert these over to one unidirectional trains. Now instead of having them reverse out, what we can instead do is have them just curve around. 
as in come out this way and go back out on that rail. It just requires us to do a little bit of movement here. I wanted this in first because you realize you will have to move this so you can get the, uh, the railing out. There we go. Quick bit of surgery. We're able to pile that rail straight through there and back out the other side. We'll have to do a little bit of signaling, but first let's uh, tidy up these belts here. A little bit of belt fooey and we're through. Oh, wait, nope, missed that one. There's always something. We would have figured that out eventually. Now, after we've done that, we also want to make sure that there's uh, some, a few signals around here. You see, I'll put it in a signal over there and a signal over there just to break this up a little bit. And we've stripped off the locomotive at the end. Now this is unidirectional. It goes around and comes right back out again. Very, very simple and easy to do system. Now we should really do in a train loader, but I think I think we'll set up one iron mine first before we throw in the train loader so that you can see why we need one. All we have been doing so far is just laying out rails in a straight line, just the same rails again and again that we were using already. This uh, this little blueprint here, just again and again, all the way chucked along. Now what we wanna do is we wanna go right. We wanna go over here. There's a, an iron patch over here we wanna tap into. Actually, we don't wanna go straight. Actually, if we go straight, we'll cut through it. Ooh, maybe we should go a little bit further. One second. This looks more like it. If we take a right here, we should end up yep, behind the iron. We don't want to go straight through it, otherwise it'll cause us, you know, issues of trying to tap into it while we're running through it. So once you get to a corner, you just throw down one of these T-junctions. Now, some people will talk about, oh, you can use roundabouts and all sorts of fancy stuff. No, T-junctions. Just use a T-junction everywhere. If you want to take a right, put in a T-junction. Even if you're never going to use the left, just stick in a T-junction. This means you only need two blueprints to do, well, pretty much anything. To go from one point of the map to the other, I'm sure you have to go in straight lines and you will have to maybe terraform the odd place here and there to get through and oh my god that's so many trees. One minute and I'll, I'll, I'll cut back in when we get to the iron patch. It's a good idea to hold off on trains until you get your hands on construction robots. Before construction robots this is just painful to do. At least with construction robots it's not super fast but it's not painfully slow. Could you imagine placing down each one of these rail segments and then as well as that putting down the, the signaling and the power? You really do want to bring power with you when you're going there because you're going to need to power those miners and having your power spine built into your rail network is just, it's just good business. We're close enough to the iron patch now. We'll go down, we'll have a quick look, we'll set up some mines and then after we've done that we'll figure out where we're going to put our train station. Once we know where we're putting our train station we'll know where to put our junction to allow it on. Now give me one moment. While we were here I thought we'd do a quick blueprint for mining. We'll just grab this, use it as a blueprint and then next time we're laying down mines we can do them a lot faster than having to go around manually. Ooh, that reminds me, we should throw in some efficiency modules. This makes placing all the mines so much faster. We have stuck the entire, we've covered the entire thing in drills. Now we've got all of it, well all the output is going to go out this way. Now we want to load balance it. We want to have all eight load balance so before we load it onto the train it all spreads evenly across all the carriages load balancer in place. I maybe made this a little bit too tight but once I placed it down I decided not to move it. Instead used a couple of undergrounders. But there's eight belts of blue coming in here. Honestly you can get away with red at the start if you really want. You're going to be putting down a lot of these mining mining outposts and after a while you realize it doesn't really matter how fast the throughput is you're just going to have so many of them it'll make no difference. Now we just want to stick in a train station here to load it all on. This fabulously ugly and simplistic train station is what we're going with. We have eight blue belts coming in that are load balanced. Those eight belts are split up, two for each carriage. So one this side, one that side. Eight, well, we've got six inserters here putting into buffer chests that then feed into the trains themselves. And this is a unidirectional train, so it'll come back out and around that way. Yep, yeah. you don't need to get fancy with these. You are going to have so much resources when you're playing any sort of train based stuff. Once you can, when you're not playing a death world, let's say, it's so easy to find more ore. Like there's more iron over there, more iron over there, more iron over there. And it gets faster and faster to tap into those as you get better and better at doing it. this. Once you have the blueprints down for one train station, we're just going to copy and paste this to the next. However, this is only... Mm, we're, if we only run one train, we won't be able to keep up with the throughput. So we need to put in probably... We'll aim for about four trains at this, but we need somewhere to park them. Otherwise, they're going to cause problems. Actually, let me show you the problems I'm talking about. Just say we make the train station this big and we have the exit over here. What will happen is, if we have four trains servicing this, the second train will sit in here behind this, and if it's taking a while for this one to load up, it'll just sit there. And then a third train will come in, and it won't be able to park. It won't have any room to get off the in intersection. And because it's stuck out on the intersection, no more trains will be able to pass. Basically, with its ass sticking out on the line, no one can get by. And this is called you, calls you a train pileups. Well, not a pileups. The, the trains will stop intelligently, assuming everything's working right. It just means no one will be able to get by and you'll end up with clogs in your network. So what you do is you put in a, what's called a train stacker. Basically it's a parking lot for trains. Train stacker is just a, the train version of parking lot. And let's stick in a quick one here. They're pretty straightforward to put together. And this is what the train parking lot looks like or stacker. It's just 
this chicane's off to the side, and then we have four rows in here where four trains can wait if they want to access. I'll probably only assign four whole trains to this, so this is a bit of a waste, but I do like to keep it a, at a standard, so four as a standard just seems like a good measure for me. I also leave a little bit of excess weight, size weight, uh, space on the end, just in case I decide to add on a carriage to, or two to a train, because if I decide to, say, service this outpost, I can tell my train a train to come here, and then I can stop it in here and, you know, do whatever I'm doing while I'm servicing the outpost before leaving again. There's just a, a few handy reasons to maybe keep your parking lot just a little bit longer than you really need it. Yeah, but now that that's up, let's go and uh, plug this into our train grid. So all we're going to do is we're going to hang a right here and go straight up and connect, plug into our train system. Some people would use, say, curved rails here, and you could just curve these up to go up to the top, but that seems like effort to me. I normally just go straight for another one of these, even though there is no way I will ever use that exit. Actually, there's an oil well down there. Maybe I will. Even if there was, wasn't was an oil well down there, I'd still just throw in a T-junction. It saves you so much time and you don't have to think about how things should work. Uh, let's uh, go plug in here. When sort of connecting up here, what I like to do is rip out the stuff that's already there. We'll have to replace the, uh, the power wires in a bit. In fact, let's just take out the whole thing. Ah, oh, there's trees everywhere. With all the trees gone, all we do is We've broken a gap in the rails, we then stick in our little T-junction, and that's it. I really like the fact that you can just use the T-junction for just about anything. It just simplifies dealing with rails for the first time. If this is your first time dealing with rails, trust me, this just makes things so much simpler. And now that's connected, except for I'm missing... Oh, damn it. One second, I brought our train along. This here is a little train I filled up with goodies so that we could make sure we didn't run out of things like, say, rails or rail signals or these suckers here. Actually, we've got enough of those. So now we can go back and fill those in. Now I'll probably fill in a few bits and bobs and then we'll go back and uh, we'll start activating the trains. We are now ready to switch this on. Now, whoop, get out of the way. There we go, all of them are going to start spitting out the ore. Ore will come down here and get sorted and start getting thrown into the train station. Now we have four trains set up over here. This is where things get a little bit confusing for some people, if they're not confusing enough already. You can uh, rename your train station. So for example, this train station here is called Iron Outpost 1, in the hopes that we're going to have multiple iron outposts at some point in the future. Then this is called Iron Main 1. Just, this is a naming convention I used, silly. This is the main iron. All we do then is we grab this train and we say, okay, you, we want you to go to Iron Outpost 1, and we want you to stay there until your cargo bay is full. Then once you've done that, we want you to go to Iron Main, which is the home base, and we're going to add a weight condition there as well, where you are going to stay until your cargo bay is empty. So move to the Iron Outpost, fill up your cargo. Once your cargo is empty, go to Iron Main. Once your, oh, sorry, once your cargo is full, go to Iron Main. Once your cargo is empty there, come back and just keep doing it. That's it. Simple. Brute force. No worries about it at all. And then we just copy that over to the other three. Actually, we should probably set that thing to automatic as well. It's currently on manual. And then we shift right click it. Shift left click, shift left click, shift left click, and they should all have the exact same one. Nope, they're all on manual. Hold on. Automatic. Automatic. And automatic. See, now these two are waiting here. You'll see the way that there's a... Uh, we don't want to get too deeply into this, but these here stop it from going any further because this tile is occupied by this train. This train, it won't move until that one gets out of the way, and why are we getting no ore on the sides? Oh! Yep. My bad. What the? Get out of the way, tree. Ah, it's the little things that get you when you're not looking. Hey, you. That way. Perfect. Hey, once all of that is full, <laughs> we should probably actually get our train out of the way. Time to go home. This here is going to fill up. Once it's done, it'll head on back. Uh, so we're going to meet that back at the iron main station, and we're going to have to plug that into our system so all of that iron ore can go into our smelters. And here it comes now. We barely made it back in time. So that's spitting out all the iron ore. Iron ore is going across. We already know this works because we've tested it. And the train's off again. Now the reason I used four trains is, as you'll see, this one is starting to load. The third train is... Oh! I left behind a wagon. One second, I'm going to have to fix that, aren't I? When that train arrives, we'll, we'll stick an extra wagon on it. Oh, that's assuming there's space. Is there... Yeah, yeah, there'll be plenty of space for it. I have no idea how I messed that up. Okay, slightly embarrassing. But now we have all of this iron ore pouring out here. Let's plug it into our main system. Time to hook this system up. We're just gonna 
check these in here. I've been doing a little bit of side work in the background to make sure all these are ready to go. We're only going to be plugging in four of them. I'll show you why in a second. Well, four of those, oh, damn it, actually we'll be plugging in six, never mind. But only four of them are going to be used. Namely because we're doing a little bit of a migration of where all of our uh, iron smelting is going on. These are late game iron smelting. Well, the early late game iron smelters? They're running on belts. Anyway, they're be beaconed, moduled, the whole nine yards, and this should give us one solid belt of iron plate at the other side. Well, once they kick up, kick into gear. And there you go, they've kicked into gear. Oh, damn it, I forgot to put in the middle pieces. One second. So there we go. Four solid belts of iron plate, blue belt iron plate added to the belt bus. That should help tide us over for a while, especially considering we're running on a fresh iron ore patch over here. Uh, also, this blueprint includes a radar, so you can at least go over and have a check and make sure, yeah, we're, we're definitely going well. Oh, yeah, remember that bit I said about how we demonstrate why it's a bad idea to not have train stackers? Well, here's why you should have train stackers. <laughs> There's one, two, three, four. Oop, fifth train would have broken that. Good thing we only have one train set up. We need to stick, put in a stacker here as well to stop uh, this backing out onto the line. Though this is going to be a core base, so we're going to have to make a larger stacker because we're going to be sending a lot more trains here long term. And this is our new train stacker. This will hold about eight trains. We'll probably have to expand that quite a bit later on. But for now, it should be sufficient for our needs. Just, I'm going to go delete that rail and it'll, you know, I'll do that in a minute. With that done, we've finally got iron coming in. And we've got iron coming in quantities that, yeah, it's swamping our main bus. With these four, with three extra blue lines thrown in, it's actually turning, sorry, four extra blue lines thrown in, it's really just saturating it. We're going to have to find a way to dispose of our old iron plate facilities, but we'll just convert those over to copper or something along the way. The iron coming from down here, I have started rerouting it up here and plugging it in with the train stuff. Now, I've said it would priority feed, so it prefers taking the iron ore from the mines we have locally, namely because we want to strip mine the local area because it'll free up more space. I mean, we could build over that space, but it just feels wrong to build over iron ore right this close to my base, so we're going to strip it out before we do it. We might even dump speed modules in there. No, 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 it's fine. It can wait. I think next up we'll be expanding copper. The reason being, copper is now starting to look a little bit weak. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's something very important we need to take care of first, and that is train fuel. We need to keep make sure that the trains get automatically refueled, so we're going to put in uh, some sort of refueling section. For the time being, I just threw in some rocket fuel I had lying around from the tank. So, yeah, let's go straight for nuclear. I think we'll run some uh, light oil over here. We'll run some oil over here. We'll put in some uranium into it, and we'll go straight for nuclear fuel. Making nuclear fuel for our trains is going to be fairly straightforward. We're going to have to bring in some light oil. That was... Okay, it took a little bit of a shenaniganry to get that here. It's a bit of a distance away. Uh, once we get the light oil in, that starts allowing us to make solid fuel. Then we have to turn that solid fuel into rocket fuel, which means we need to grab... Oh my god, my inventory is a mess. I'll clean that up later. Probably. Then we need to turn that uh, stuff into rocket fuel, which is right here, and that just requires solid fuel. Done. So, oh, we also need light oil there. Damn it. One second. There we go. We just uh, had... We just chicane the oil out there, put it in there, done. Now we get that, we start dumping those in there, that will start making rocket fuel. Now, once we get rocket fuel, we have to turn that into nuclear fuel. That takes a little bit more effort, but not that much considering how much effort we put in already. And you need a centrifuge for that, and you do make nuclear fuel by using one rocket fuel and one uranium-235, or the shiny expensive stuff. Now, where did I put those stack inserters? Ah, here we go. And done. Well, no, we need to get the shiny uranium. Shiny uranium is going to come from over here. Uh, this is our setup we made a while back for our nuclear weapons program that we haven't got around to yet. I s severely overestimated how soon we were going to need that. Anyway, let's uh, bring this down here and plug it in. And there we go. A big line of shiny uranium lined up to fill this sucker up. Now, that's going to take a while to craft. It's quite slow, so maybe let's speed these things along a little bit. Can't hurt, can it? Uh, you know what, let's double layer that. We have so much power to spare, it makes no difference to us. Ooh, actually, let's offset them. There we go. Beacons are now in place. Now, it's been pointed out to me, I forgot to mention exactly what beacons do. Beacons just have a, an area of effect, and it transfers the effect of modules to nearby equipment. However, there are limitations on them. Uh, by limitations, I mean you can only put speed and efficiency modules in them. You can't put productivity modules. Productivity modules are only allowed to be put in these type of machines, or end product machines. So, like these ones, these ones, and these ones. Actually, can it work with nuclear fuel? Damn it! Okay, turns out it doesn't work with nuclear fuel. 
Fair enough, but now we'll speed beacon this all up, or speed module all those beacons, and boom, that should be much faster. All we have to do now is plug the output of this into our train network. Well, our first train. We're going to be having multiple trains later, so let's uh, just line something up so it's expandable. We have created a very simple delivery method, because you know me, I like simple. Oh, wrong way. Here we go. All that happens is the nuclear fuel gets made here, it gets chucked out onto this blue belt. This blue belt runs all the way down here, under the train rails, pops out the other side, and when it gets to here, we just grab a stack inserter. Actually, regular inserter's fine. And the reg inserter picks it up and throws it into the train. And there we go, nuclear fueled up. Now, of course, there is rocket fuel still in there. We could rip that out, but I'm not willing to rip that out just yet. We'll we'll let the nuclear fuel kick in. Eventually, the rocket fuel will get wasted. There's no rush on this. Our trains are plenty efficient as it is. And this will just keep churning out nuclear fuel. And let's check and see if any of this is switched back on again. No. Oh, my God. Why is it blocked up? One moment. I need to troubleshoot this. So it turns out having this uh, priority feed on was not good enough. So we've stuck a few chests back here, and we're going to feed it on a little bit further back. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Maybe it'll make a difference. Anyway, that's all spin spinning back up again, and we should have uranium flowing properly. Well, we haven't beaconed it up yet. Later, later. I know there was a lot to cover this episode when we were doing trains. It was hard to try and compress it all in and give you uh, reasonable examples. Plus, I was kind of relearning it all myself again. Though there's one thing I left out that I'd like to just mention at the end. It's not important if you're new to trains, but for me, it's a personal preference. There's a, what's called a chunk map. This is called a chunk map. Uh, this is unique for some reasons. Uh, for example, if there is nothing in a chunk, the game stops doing calculations on it and stops caring about it. If there's a radar in that chunk, though, it never lets that chunk die, so it will always have to do calculations for activity in that chunk. It's just one of the game processing things. But what you can do with that is you can make chunk-aligned things. So this is what you would call a chunk-aligned rail, or a chunk-aligned T-junction. As in, this T-junction fits precisely inside a chunk. So if we placed it in there, you'd see it fits perfectly inside it, or you can turn it that direction, or that direction. And that's that's how I like to line up my rails. That means that all of my center rails here will all be lined up right in the middle. This is very handy for things like, say, oh, just say we're extending this on, and but we're starting over here. We can sort of zip across, figure out what chunk it's in, and just start from the other side, and know we'll be lined up perfectly when we get there. Uh, some future plans for this rail system, though, is we are going to get these rails, and we're going to run them down here, and then run them across. That's actually a corner junction I've put in in advance. So we're going to be putting a giant square sort of rail system around our base, which means we're going to need a lot of landfill, like an awful, awful, awful lot of landfill. So it's a good thing we made all that stuff earlier. Now if we do this just right, one second, there we go. That should be just wide enough to run our train all the way down here when the time comes. This does feel like a little bit sacrilegious of all the fish we're destroying, but you know what? There's plenty more fish in the sea. And would you look at that, when we get to the other side, the rails are perfectly aligned for some bizarre reason. So handy, just so handy. Oh, you just get rid of that. Oh yeah, I think we'll cut it out there. Uh, I think we got an awful lot done at the same time. We we definitely managed to expand, though. We do need to put in another copper expansion because our copper on our main bus is a little bit shy, so we'll have to fix that. We'll have to upgrade all the copper to electric smelting. We'll have to change all the steel over as well and the brick. In fact, our entire smelting array will have to get boosted up. And our power will probably have to be boosted as well because we're at 500 megawatts already and all of that's going to add on a lot of power demand. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed and uh, good luck. Good luck.